This podcast that you're about to listen to was originally recorded in 2018, so it's six years old, and if the audio is not as polished and not as perfect as you are accustomed to, that's because it was much more primitive, our recording apparatus and our best practices that we've adopted ever since, so please forgive me, but I got an email from my friend Morris, and he tells me that he's re-listening to the Purim Story podcast uh, before Purim. Of course, Purim's upcoming in a couple of days. So I thought, well, if Morris is listening to it, maybe someone else would want to listen to it as well. So I am hereby going to re-release it so you could enjoy it as you prepare for Purim, which is happening this year on, on Sunday. And what I did was I took two episodes. There was the Purim backstory and then the Purim story, and I fused them together into one episode, so that way you could hear it all in, in one shot, in one go, and to get more of an understanding of the, of the background, of the historical context of, of Purim, to hopefully enrich your experience of this wonderful festival that is upcoming. Now, because this is a, a merging of two episodes into one, I, you may hear references, oh, we're doing this one episode, we'll do the second episode later, and then you'll hear it, and it's like, well, no, it's not the second episode, it's all one big episode. That's that's the reason why, because I just, I attached them, to, I stitched them together, it's all one big episode, that the first 35, 37 minutes or so, is, it's the first episode of the backstory of Purim, and uh, from there onward, it is the story of Purim. So I hope you enjoy it, I hope you uh, find it valuable, and of course, my email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. Enjoy the Purim podcasts now merged into one, and have a wonderful and happy Purim. Purim is a holiday celebrated by Jews worldwide on the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar. In the rest of the world, it is on the 14th day we celebrate it. On walled cities, such as Jerusalem and its surrounding suburbs, it is celebrated on the 15th day of Adar. Now, it commemorates the salvation of the Jewish nation from the genocidal ambitions and efforts of Haman and Ahasuerus and their cohorts in Persia. What I want to do tonight is tell the story of how the Jews ended up in Persia, living under the Persians in the middle of the Middle East. So we're going to try to do the batch story, setting the stage for the Purim story. How did the nation that conquered Israel, conquered Judea under Joshua, how did they suddenly end up under the auspices of Ahasuerus and Haman in Persia? So the plan is that this week we'll tell the batch story of Purim, and next week we will tell the actual story of Purim as it is told in the Bible, in the book of Esther, and in other classical sources of Jewish literature. I want to begin the story at the end of the first commonwealth. The Jewish people, they enter the land of Israel after Moshe dies. According to Jewish sources, that is 1272 before the common era. They spend significant time quieting the local inhabitants that are there, the Canaanites, the seven Canaanite nations under 31 kings, 31 city-states. For the majority of the beginning years, they have to deal with pockets of resistance and rebellion. But eventually, they have a certain degree of quiet and stability. And things really hit their apex when the first king, King Saul, is instituted. But really, his reign passes over very quickly, and King David, the archetype, the prototype, the quintessential Jewish king, is installed as the king of Israel. He finishes the conquest of the land, he purchases and conquers Jerusalem, and under the leadership of Solomon, King Solomon, his son, the first temple is built. Now, we are going to pick up the story at the end of the first temple. The first temple and the second temple both stand for roughly 400 years. One of them is 410 years. One of them is 420 years. The first is 410. The second is 420. And in the middle of the first time of wealth of the first temple era, there's going to be a massive shift. There's going to be a schism, and the northern tribes are going to secede. 
They're going to form their own country called the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The Southern Kingdom of Judah is going to be comprising the Jewish nation uh, thenceforth. So our story begins in the 5th century before the Common Era. The 10 lost tribes of of Israel, of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, are long gone. They were conquered by the Assyrians under Sancherib, and they were resettled to parts unknown and replaced instead by people called the Samaritans. At this time, the southern kingdom of Judah is still led and inspired by prophets. The most notable of them for our purposes is, of course, Jeremiah. But unfortunately, the the overarching trend of the nation is downhill. Many of the kings, they embrace idolatry, and even during the reign of some of the righteous kings, there are vast swaths of the nation that spiral downhill towards spiritual erosion and idolatry. And the prophet Jeremiah, his career is marked by calls of repentance, as all prophets are, but also predictions of doom if the Jews don't write their path. The Jewish people have been in Israel for 800 years already. To them, it's, they might as well be there forever. It's permanent. But of course, we're reading the Torah. There's many verses in the Torah that say that the conquest of the land and the settlement of the land is conditional. If the Jewish people uphold their spiritual stature, they get the merit to remain there. If they devolve, if they adopt the ways of the Canaanites, just like the Canaanites were evicted from the land, so too the Jews will be evicted. And that is Jeremiah's message to the nation. Repent quickly, reject, eschew idolatry, or else terrible things are going to happen. And he was not one to coddle uh, or to comfort the nation. Only once the destruction actually happens, only then does he begin to comfort the nation. And he's not a very popular prophet. Uh, People don't like when they're told terrible things that will happen to them. They want to be given a message of hope. And the role of Jeremiah was to give them the brass tacks and to tell them what is going to be and to try to compel them to go back to God, back to Torah and away from idolatry. But sadly, much of his warnings fell on deaf ears. At the time, the ascendant empire was the Babylonian Empire, and they were committed to capturing the entirety of the land controlled by the previous mega-empire, the Assyrians, and that, of course, included Judea. So what to do? Do we resist these new Babylonian conquerors? Do we submit ourselves to them, become a vassal state to them? So Jeremiah is of the opinion to submit to the Babylonians, to give in to them, to accept their their rule. But the Jewish king, Yehoiakim, he decides to launch a rebellion against the Babylonians, which was very foolish. And you would imagine that his philosophy was, well, we have God on our side and we win every war because we're the Jews and we've been here for forever and no foreign invader is going to conquer us. But sadly, uh, he was mistaken. And Jeremiah is publicly opposing this revolt, and he's prophesizing about exile, about dispersion, about, about, about sadness, about things all heading south. And he's even writing prophetically the book of Lamentations, the book of Echa, the book that we read on Tishabav, the book that details and outlines the desolation of Jerusalem and the terrible things that happened. And for his trouble, he's flogged. And he's arrested, and he's imprisoned, and there's even death threats that he has to face. And there's imposters, there's fake prophets that are comforting the nation and comforting the king, saying, no, don't worry, anything bad's going to happen to you. And they even take the scrolls of his prophecy, and they burn them. As would be expected, this initial revolt is absolutely silenced by the Babylonians, but this does not lead to a total destruction of all of Judea. Instead, what they chose to do was to take the cream of the crop, take the leaders, the movers and shakers of the nation, 
And if you take that class away, the leaders are gone. That's very likely uh, or, or, or more likely to, to mitigate the risk of future rebellion. And they figured, the Babylonians did, we're not going to destroy Judea. We're just going to take away from them the people who could potentially lead a rebellion. And that way, we will ensure that a future rebellion will not happen. So the king is taken away, and many prophets taken away, and many people who ran industries, and all those people are taken to Babylon, and they're removed from Judea. A new king is installed, Tzitzkiyahu, or Zedekiah, and he's there for several years. He's not really viewed as a very strong leader, which is probably the reason why the Babylonians chose him to begin with, but he quite foolishly, he launches a revolt again against the Babylonians. It seems likely that it was he wasn't really the power player. It was more his advisors, but he agreed to have this revolt under his reign. Jeremiah again objects, and again he is thrown into prison. And the military situation begins to deteriorate quite seriously, and the king calls on to Jeremiah. They extract him from prison. And they have a serious conversation. And the book of Jeremiah in chapter 38 details this conversation. The king says to him, okay, I want to know what's actually going to happen. Don't sugarcoat anything for me. And the prophet tells him, if I don't sugarcoat it, you might not be happy. And if you're not happy, you might feel a distinct urge to shoot the messenger. (laughs) So the deal is, I'll tell you what God has planned for you on the condition that you don't kill me. So Tzitkiyo, Zedekiah, he swears in God's name that he's not going to harm Jeremiah or not to allow others to harm. And Jeremiah tells him very clearly, you better submit and surrender to Babylon. If you do that, your life will be spared. The life of your children will be spared. Jerusalem won't be destroyed. However, if you continue the revolt... The Babylonians will burn down the entire city, will destroy Judea, will take you hostage. Things are really bad. This is not quite what Sitiyah was expecting. And he was worried that if this message goes out, that's going to disempower the revolt. And it's going to spread fear in the ranks of the troops. And therefore, he makes Jeremiah swear not to reveal the contents of this conversation. He was worried, what's going to be, there will be mutiny if this gets out. So he tells him, if anyone asks you what happened, what did we talk about? Just tell them that we talked about other things. You try to get out of prison, whatever. Don't tell them what you actually told me. And Jeremiah abides by this command, is returned to prison. The verse describes all the officers came over to Jeremiah, what, what were we talking about? What's the deal? And he's like, he told them the, the, the made-up story, and he was thrown back into prison where he, were, he remained until the Babylonians actually ca- captured Jerusalem. Now, this revolt really ended very poorly for the Jewish nation, for Judea, for the king, for the temple, for everyone involved. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the Babylonian Empire. He laid siege to Jerusalem, and this two-year siege really marks one of the low points in our history. And if you read the Book of Lamentations, it outlines the terrible events that happened in Jerusalem, the mass starvation, resorting to cannibalism that happened during those times. I want to read you a quote from chapter 4 in the Book of Lamentations, the Book of Echa. The tongue of the suckling infant cleaves to its palate from thirst. Young children beg for bread. No one extends it to them. Those who once feasted extravagantly lie destitute in the streets. Those who were brought up in scarlet clothing wallow in trash. Their appearance has become blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the street. Their skin has shriveled to on their bones. It has become dry as wood. Hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food when the daughter of my people was shattered. So this is a description of just terrible things that were happening in Jerusalem during the time of the siege. On the 17th day of Tammuz, 
the walls of the city were breached. In fact, we still, till this day, every year on the seventh day of Tammuz, there is a fast day to mark this point in the destruction of the, of the temple. Thousands of Babylonians poured in through the city walls and began a month of slaughter. On the ninth day of Av, exactly three weeks later, the temple was set aflame. The temple was destroyed. The royal palace was destroyed. The vessels of the temple were looted. The city was burned to the ground. Now, King Tzitkiyahu, he had made some sort of plans to evade capture were such circumstances to happen. So he had a tunnel burrowed out of the city and away to the, uh, to the Jordanian Valley towards the uh, Ein Gedi Yamamelech area. And that was his plan. Him and his family would escape. And he tries to escape. And according to the Midrash, what happened is the Babylonian soldiers were trying to capture a deer. And wherever they were tracking it, and the deer kept evading them. So they kept on following it until he led them, so to speak, to the entrance of the tunnel. And who waltzes out of the entrance of the tunnel? It's the king, it's his people, and they grab them. And in typical Babylonian cruelty, they first murdered his children in front of him, and then they gouged out his eyes, the eyes of the king Sithio, and along with Caravans of Jewish survivors are led in chains to Babylon. And this march is just one of the saddest marches in history. Jewish people, according to Jewish sources, have been living in the land. There's been ups and downs, of course, but they've been in the land for 852 years. And now it seems like it's, it's all over. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, the Babylonians did not want him to go and join the nation. And he refused to remain a free man while his brothers were being led in chains into slavery. And he tried to follow to see where they are, where's these roads that they're leading them to Babylon. And we're told in Jewish sources, he came upon one road that it has streets of blood going up and down. He knows this is, this is the road to follow. And he looks on the ground in a very dramatic episode, and he sees ch- small little footsteps of small children. And he stoops down low and kisses these footsteps. This is the future of our nation. Eventually, he finds the captives. He embraces them. He cries out out loud and weeps alongside them. Woe to you, my brothers and my people. How did such a thing terrible, terrible happen to you? Why did you guys not listen to my prophecy? You should have, instead of crying now, you should have cried then. One ounce of repentance before the destruction could have maybe staved it off. And he, with his tremendous love for his brethren, he takes the iron chains and puts it upon his own shoulders and identifies with them. But they arrive uh, to Babylon. Many have died on the way. Many die once they get there. And we get, of course, a very vivid description of what happened to them along the way. Chapter, I think it's 137 of the book of Psalms on the rivers of Babylon, the Babylonians, they're trying to stir up a mirthful song from the captives. Sing to us like you sing in the temple. How could we sing the song of God on foreign land? And they take a a pledge and an oath. If I forget you, O Jerusalem... Let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue adhere to my palate if I fail to recall you. Very famous words that we still say today to mourn Jerusalem. If I fail to elevate Jerusalem above my foremost joy, such terrible things that they're saying, bad things should happen to me if I ever forget these moments. And thus begins the Babylonian settlement. The Jews are going to remain, or a contingency of Jews are going to remain in Babylon. From that point, until the most recent century, uninterrupted. Of course, then almost all the Jews are coalesced in Babylon. And though they are led to Babylon in chains, things kind of improve sort of rapidly. They're going to be granted for a large portions of their time in Babylon a certain degree of autonomy, of self-governance. They're going to have their go-between who is going to intermediate between them and the Babylonians and they are going to be allowed to have their own system of laws and their own uh, judicial system and courts. And moreover, those 10,000 Jews that were led into exile a decade prior, well, they got to Babylon, 
and they established a thriving Jewish community with all the needed infrastructure. And the Talmud points out that this is a, an example of God giving the antidote before the malady, that the, the remedy for the plight of the Jewish nation, where they're going to come to Babylon, and what's going to be with them? How are they going to have continuity? How are they going to have a community that's going to be able to thrive and absorb all these traumatized immigrants? What's going to be with them? Well, God says, okay, I'm going to send a contingency 10 years in advance, and they'll build whatever is needed to absorb the new immigrants and have a thriving Jewish life. Jeremiah tells them, you're going to be here for a while. Pitch your tent. Tells them to build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat your fruit. This is going to be a place where you're going to be for a little bit. Marry women, bear children, take wives for your sons, give your daughters husbands, settle down. This is your new home. Uh, Get used to it. And the Jews, indeed, in Babylon, they settled in towns along the Euphrates rivers, and they began that civilization. Now, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a thing for Jewish advisors. The Jews, as they are today, were quite capable, competent, quite clever, honest. And he selected a cadre of young Jewish advisors to be in his inner circle. Most primary among them is, of course, Daniel. But in addition, we have other prophets like Hanania, Mishal, and Azariah, very famous Jewish leaders who also were part of the, uh, of the advisory board of Nebuchadnezzar. And they tried to maintain their Jewish identity and their Jewish life and their Jewish practice and their Jewish standards despite being in Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And there's a major event that happens in Nebuchadnezzar's life that's going to raise the prominence of Daniel But also, it's a harbinger of God's plans for the Jewish nation and really the world stage going forward. Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a terrifying dream. It's so terrifying and so vivid, but he's going to forget it when he wakes up. And in his dream, he sees a huge statue whose head is made of gold, its chest and its arms are made of silver, Its thighs are made of copper, its legs are made of iron, its feet and toes are part iron and part clay earthenware. And suddenly, this small little stone, this rolls up, it hits the the statue, and it breaks, and it destroys, and fragments and shards of this statue start shooting in all different directions, and the the small stone eventually grows into a mighty mountain. And the king wakes up, and he's all shaken up, and he knew he has a dream, and he knew it has some sort of meaning to him, but he forgets the dream. And of course, he doesn't know the dream's interpretation, because he can't remember the dream. Quickly, he calls all his advisors and says, okay, what did I dream last night? And what does it mean? And of course, and all the necromancers and magicians and all the people there that were the soothsayers... They tell him, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, O king, how are we supposed to know what dream you had last night and what it means? You can't remember it. How do you expect us to remember it? And he threatens them with a deadly ultimatum. He says, either remember my dream for me, or I'm going to kill you all. And Daniel, thanks to the Almighty, reminds him of his dream. Moreover, he interprets the dream for him. And he tells him, this gold head, obviously it's descending in stature. There's the gold and the silver, and then it goes downhill from that. The gold head, well, that's you. That's the Vuchanetzer. You're the greatest king and the greatest empire. You have everything. However, you're going to be usurped. And there's going to be the next level, the silver chest and the silver arms. That's going to be the Persians and the Medes. They're going to be the successors to your great empire. And then the thighs made of copper are going to be the Greeks, and the iron leads are going to be the Romans who ruled uh, with an iron fist. And the partly iron and partly clay feet, that's referring to the Christians and the Muslims, the other great empires that are going to be the next on the world stage. And all the offshoots, all the toes are the various other 
offshoot empires that are going to result from the Christians and the Muslims. And that tiny stone, that tiny pebble is going to roll up and take it all over. That's a reference to Messiah. The Messiah is going to come and overthrow all these mighty kingdoms and then establish itself, the Messiah himself, as the kingdom to rule them all. Duly impressed. Nebuchadnezzar promotes Daniel, but now he's a little bit worried. What's going to be? Uh, He just essentially accepted the prophetic interpretation of a dream that spelled the demise of Nebuchadnezzar and his empire. So he decided to have a huge statue of his own likeness erected and make everyone bow and to submit the nation that to minimize the likelihood of rebellion, let's make sure everyone has it baked into them that we are totally subject to Nebuchadnezzar and we bow and prostrate ourselves before him. And of course, the Jews will have no part in it. And particularly the three other advisors, Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah, they say, we ain't bowing down to it. And Nebuchadnezzar says, you better believe you will. And he says, oh, well, we don't. Well, okay, I'm going to kill you all. We don't care. So he makes a fire in a furnace and he heats it up to seven times normal heat. And he takes these people and he binds them up and he chucks them into the fire. And the fire shoots out and goes, consumes the soldiers that are leading Hanam Shalom Azariah to the fire. He doesn't care. We're going to watch him burn anyhow. But miraculously, they see in the fire, amidst the conflagration, there's not three, but there's four figures. And they seem to be totally fine. They're remarkably unharmed. An angel was sent by God to go save these three heroes. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar is now a little shaken by this. He pulls them out and does no harm to them. And indeed, until this day, we remember and herald that event on Yom Kippur. We invoke this. God who answered Hanani, Mishal, and Azariah amidst the fiery furnace, answer us as well. Now, after Nebuchadnezzar died, there were only two more Babylonian kings. And we see this again and again throughout history, is that an a, a, a empire seems invincible. It seems like it will never diminish in stature and influence and power. But after Nebuchadnezzar conquered the whole world, there's only two more kings to follow him, to succeed him, and then the chapter of this empire will be closed. Uh, the two Babylonian kings are Evmoradach and Belshazzar, and indeed, Daniel's prophecy came true that Babylon is going to be removed and the Persians and the Medes are going to take over. And the leadership of this next cadre is King Darius of Media and King Cyrus of Persia. They're going to join forces and they're going to begin a conquest of the Babylonian Empire. So they first conquer much of the Middle East and then They do also take over Asia Minor, and they conquer all of Babylonia with the exception of the fortified city of Babylon. And the city is besieged for a long time by these armies. And then on one night, they retreat. And the king of the Babylonian Empire, Belshazzar, the descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, he's convinced that's it. The threat has been removed. They're going to return and Babylon will be spared. So he right away decrees, we're going to have a massive celebration. He calls all his advisors and he orders a massive feast. They pull out the temples, the temples vessels that they had looted, his grandfather had looted. And uh, they pull out all the concubines. It's going to be a revelry of debauchery. Everyone's going to celebrate. But amidst the celebration, uh, the revelry was halted. When everyone sees this uh, disembodied hand appears and it starts to write a message on the wall. And this strange message in a strange language, no one seems to know what it means. It's in Hebrew, it says, What does that mean? And everyone is bewildered. Everyone's frightened. All the advisors, of course, are speechless. And no one seems to know what to do. And the queen remembers. There was this uh, Jewish guy, Daniel many years prior. And 
The king, Nebuchadnezzar, he had his dream and no one seemed to know and he seemed to know all the answers. Maybe we call him. So Belshazzar calls him and says, listen, I'm going to give you everything you want, great honor, great riches, everything. Just interpret this message for me. And Daniel tells him, I'm sorry, I'm not going to accept all your rewards, but I will interpret this message. And he interprets it. God has counted the days of your kingdom and he's going to destroy it. You were evaluated and you were found guilty. Your kingship will be broken up and be given to media and Persia. And indeed, that very same night, these two powers under Darius and Cyrus, they broke into the city in Babylon. Belshazzar is assassinated either by them or by his own uh, people. And Darius the Mede, the older of the two conquerors, he becomes the emperor, the king. And now uh, the story of Babylon is now the story of the Medes and the Persians. Daniel is appointed to the high court of this new empire. That raises the envy and the ire of the other dignitaries, and they hatch a plan to derail Daniel. And they convince the king that we can't have all these offshoot religions we have to have, okay, everyone everyone partake in uh, the uh, Zoroastrianism. No, none of this uh, people praying to their own gods. And that they knew, of course, that Daniel would disobey this command. And he indeed prayed to God facing west towards Jerusalem three times a day nonetheless. And the enemies find evidence of his prayer to God. And they bring him to the king. And the king was quite fond of Daniel. But he knew that Daniel disobeyed his command. And it's important that disobeyed, rejected commands of the king do not go unpunished. So he agreed to have Daniel thrown into the lion's den. They take a bunch of hungry lions and they throw Daniel into the, into the den. They cover it up. We'll pick up the pieces in the morning. And of course, we know the miracle. God is with Daniel. The lions don't touch him. When the king sees this great miracle, he has Daniel released, and he has Daniel's enemies thrown to the same lions with quite different results. And he also made a big announcement, uh, the God of Daniel, the God of the Jews, the God of the Israelites, he is the real God. Now, he, Darius, lasts for only a year. He dies, and his partner, King Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, he becomes the king of this new mega empire, the Persian Empire. And in the first year of his rule, he issues a groundbreaking proclamation, the Cyrus's proclamation. And we know this is not only from Jewish sources, but we know this from secular sources as well, that King Cyrus made a, a, a proclamation throughout all the lands of Persia to allow all the people that were conquered by the previous Babylonians to go back to their original homelands. The way it is presented in chapter 1, the very beginning of the book of Ezra, who is going to be one of the great leaders at the end of this uh, intermittent, intermittent period between the first and second temple, it reads as follows. King Cyrus says, Hashem, God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of earth. And he has commanded me to build him a temple in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Anyone among you from his entire people, may his God be with you. And let him go up to Jerusalem in Judea and let him build a temple of Hashem, God of Israel. He is the God, which is Jerusalem. So he's essentially telling the Jewish people, go back to Israel, back to Judea, and go rebuild the temple. The temple was destroyed, what, 60 or 70 years prior? We're going to undo that. We're going to give you back your land, and we're going to give you back your right to worship freely. And a massive campaign is undertaken. The leaders of the nation, notably Zerubbabel, who is a descendant of King David, everyone expects him to be the king of this new commonwealth, Uh, Nehemiah, Zechariah, Haggai, Malachi. These are the tail ends of the prophetic era in the Jewish nation. They call upon all Babylonian Jewry, to heed the king's call and begin the plan to go back to Israel, back to Judea. And indeed, 42,000 and change 
set out on the road to Judea. Uh, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, even though they had come to Babylon in chains, they had settled down quite nicely in Babylon, in what's now Persia, the Persian Empire. And to them, the thoughts of going back to Judea, that's, that, that's in the distant past. We're here. We are comfortable here. Our businesses are here. Our families are here. Our communities are here. Our kids grew up over here. We're not going to go back to this wasteland in Judea, even though it was quite recent that we were weeping, leaving Judea coming here. But still, a significant portion of Jews decide that they're going to go. And King Cyrus affords them the vessels, many of the vessels of the temple, and troops to guard them along their journey. And they arrive to Jerusalem. And they begin the plans to rebuilding the temple. And we know that you have to have an altar in the temple, but the sages rule that the temporary altar to be erected on Temple Mount, and they begin sacrifices. And they begin these plans to, to construct a brand new temple on the grounds, on the rubble, in the very same site of Solomon's destroyed temple. And there, there's a bunch of Levites there that are in charge. There's great sages there to answer all the questions. And all the crowds, men, women, and children, young people and old people, they gather and they throng to witness this momentous historic event. We're going to lay the foundation stone upon which the new temple will be built. The young people were beside with themselves with joy. They were elated. And they were ecstatic. And the old people were a little bit down. They remember the first temple, and the first temple had a splendor and a glory that is going to outweigh the heights of the second temple. But sadly, the construction is going to be halted. Those enemies of the Jews, the Kuthites, the Samaritans, they were hell-bent on keeping the Jews out of Israel and keeping the construction of the temple, stopping it from from, from taking root and stopping the temple from going up. And initially, they tried to pretend to help the Jewish people, but they were rebuffed. The Jews said, okay, this is a construction project for us. Usually we hire outside help, not this time. This time we're going to have to build it ourselves. And the Kuthites decided on a different tactic, and they sent a message back to Persia. And they tell King Cyrus, the Jews that you sent over here, that you gave the right to go back to their land, they're rebelling against you. And sadly, the king believes their malicious charge and he orders the temple project to be halted. The building of the temple is halted. The Jews in Judea are in limbo. But back in Persia, the Babylonian Jews are about to face an existential threat. The successor to Cyrus as emperor of all of Persia is going to be Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus is going to build alliances with the erstwhile Babylonian dynasty. He's going to marry Vashti, the daughter of the last king of Babylon, of Babylonia, Belshazzar. She was one of the people who survived that feast and she's a granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to embrace some of the anti-Jewish ideology that typified the Babylonian Empire. And under his reign, the Jewish people will be given an annihilation decree. Together with the scion of Amalek, Amalek, the very first nation to contest the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, when they left Egypt, the very, that same nation that jumped in when no one else was willing to attack the Jewish people, when the Jewish people were marching triumphantly out of, out of Egypt, there was one nation that says, we are going to foil the Jews. That's Amalek. Their great, 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 great grandchild is Haman. And Haman, together with Ahasuerus, are going to begin a plot to destroy all the Jews in the entire Persian Empire. That is the batch story of Purim. And we're going to tell the story of Purim as it is told in the book of Esther. We're not going to just tell the story. We're going to intersperse it with uh, discoveries in archaeology that add to the story and history. And as well, we're going to pepper it with insights 
from Jewish tradition that bring the story to life. The story begins with King Achashverosh. He rules from Hodu to Kush. Hodu is India, all the way out east. Kush is in Ethiopia, so already in Africa, all the way west. These are the two southern tips of the Persian Empire that really covers the most of the known world. And the first several verses tell about this royal banquet that he throws for the noblemen and the ministers of Persia and Media. That's going to last for a half a year, for 180 days. They knew how to party. Purim is one day. It's pretty intense. We have Pesach is eight days. Sukkot is nine days. They did it 180 days. They, they really knew how to party. Now, why is Ahasuerus making this over-the-top celebration? Why is he having this enormous 180-day celebration? So according to the Talmud, this has to do with the Jews. More specifically, the prophet Jeremiah, he makes a prediction, a prophetic prediction. He actually makes it twice, that the exile of the Jewish people from Israel that we spoke about last week, it's only going to last for 70 years. And Ahasuerus, he miscalculated. He believed and he concluded that the 70 years had already passed and therefore the Jewish people will never be redeemed. The second temple will never be built. And to celebrate, he invited all the ministers and the noblemen and the dignitaries of Persia and Media to celebrate for 180 days. Now, why did he make such a mistake? So the Talmud actually breaks it down. The Talmud tells us that there were three distinct events that are the highlights, the the milestones of the destruction. So the first stage was the ascendancy of Nebuchadnezzar and the rise of Babylon, of Babylonia as an empire. He conquered, Nebuchadnezzar did, he conquered the city of Nineveh, which was the center of the Assyrian Empire, and that he did according to Jewish sources in the year 440 before the Common Era. And then he became the empire and the emperor that controlled the whole world. Several years later, the Jews in Judea rebelled. And the king, Yechonio, along with 10,000 of the best and brightest of the Jews, were led into exile into Babylon. But Judea was not destroyed. Jerusalem was not destroyed. The temple was not destroyed. The Judean monarchy was not destroyed. And the majority of Jews still lived in Judah, in Israel. Eleven years later, there was a second rebellion, and that led to the destruction of Jerusalem, burning the city to the ground, slaughtering countless Jews, burning the temple, destroying the palace, and taking the rest of the Jews in chains to Babylon. So there's three distinct events. Number one, the rise of Babylon. Number two, the first exile of Yehonio. And number three, the, des- the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah makes two prophecies. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 29, he describes that the redemption will happen 70 years after the ascendancy of Babylon. So if Babylon reaches the world stage in the year 440, then in the year 370 before the common era is going to be the first redemption. In the book of Daniel, chapter 9, he predicts redemption 70 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. So if Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 422, then Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt in the year 352. That's how the Talmud reconciles these two differing opinions as to when is this 70-year timeline. Is it the first or is it the third of the major events that mark the destruction of the temple? Ahasuerus, he had made a miscalculation. In his calculation, he determined that the 70 years begin from the middle stage, from the year 433, when the first exile of the Jews from Israel, from Judea to to Babylon happened, and thus 70 years later is the year 363. He throws this massive celebration. Yes, King Cyrus allowed the Jews to go back to Judea, and the process of building the second temple had begun, but it stopped, and immigration was halted, and the building plans, they were stalled, 
And now it's been 70 years since the first exile, and Achashverosh wants to celebrate. And therefore, he gathers all the ministers from this, his kingdom, the kingdom of Persia and Media, and they make this massive celebration to celebrate that the temple is not currently rebuilt and is not going to be rebuilt. Now, the beginning of chapter 1 of the Book of Esther describes in superlative terms the kind of celebration. And it's centered in the city of Shushan, the capital city of this empire. The previous emperor, the Babylonians, so Babylon is more like Iraq, which is further west. And their center, their capital city, was the city of Babylon. After Darius and Cyrus, after they conquered Babylon, they have the new Persian Empire, they moved the capital city from Babylon to Babylonia, further east, what is today Iran, which is Persia, and the city of Shushan. And it's interesting that we actually know where this city is today. There is a small Iranian city called, in English, Susa. But in Persian, it's Shush, which is the same name as Shushan. And in this city, it's relatively small today, but there's the excavated remains of an incredible palace, most likely the same palace that the, this celebration is happening in. And you could still see it today. And the size of this palace and this complex is mind-boggling how big this is. And we think about it, the whole world is really gathering together. All the important people are gathering together here in this in this palace for half a year, and we actually could visit this place. Maybe it might, might not be the best idea to go to Iran to do it, but <laughs> maybe you could do it from Google Earth. You could see pictures of, of just how big and how ornate this palace is. The complex is built upon three different mounds. Each mound is surrounded by valleys, which makes it more defensible. And to enter you'd have to cross a 100-foot bridge from one mound to the second mound, crossing over one of the valleys, where you get to the very impressive King's Gate. If you read the story of the Book of Esther, you find that Mordechai is always sitting Bishar HaMelech in the King's Gate. We can actually see the excavated remains of this King's Gate today in this city of Susa. Now, the palace grounds themselves are enormous. Uh, the total area... It spreads over 32 acres. And the complex is actually broken down into two separate parts. There's the official section where they would have these celebrations. And there is the private residence. And the reason why we know so much about this is because they actually found archaeological remains signed by King Darius of Persia, where he describes everything that he did to build this place and every, everything that he collected, all the materials that he collected to build this incredible palace. And the centerpiece of this palace in the official section is a place, is, is a room called the Apadna. The Apadna is the P Persian word for palace. It's a building, an indoor building, roughly twice the size of a football field. It's 108 thousand square foot building and this roof made out of cedar wood brought in from lebanon a thousand miles away this roof was held up by 36 columns 36 marble columns and the size of these columns are so big even though they're all they're all destroyed now but you could still see the bases the bases of these columns are still present in this city in this in this palace and just the base of the of each column is the size the height of a man that's how that's how tall and and the the columns themselves were 65 foot tall just an enormous room and in this building all the ministers and the noblemen and the dignitaries are gathering for this incredible banquet and at the foot of the throne room of this palace, they found the foundation tablets and in it, Darius, in in three different languages. He is bragging about building this incredible, magnificent palace. He describes the excavation. 
and the importing the cedar wood from Lebanon and the silver and ebony from Egypt, the gold from the Sardis. Sardis is a region that is at the northeastern tip of the empire. All the location where they source the rest of the gems and precious stones, etc. Now, what do they do for these 180 days? So the verse tells us, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and his servants, the army Persian media, the nobles and the officials of the provinces being present when he displayed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his splendorous majesty for many days, 180 days. The content, well, what was the entertainment of this party? It was displaying riches and wealth. Because they had conquered essentially the whole world, they had all the world's wealth coalesced here in this palace. And the Talmud actually describes that part of the display was the incredible gold and valuable and ornate vessels of the temple. It even describes Ahasuerosh getting dressed up in the beautiful garments of the high priest of the Kohen Gadol. But it also goes on to describe that this was not just Ahasuerus having a good time. Everyone's drinking from goblets of gold. And they're sitting and reclining on couches that are made of gold. Every person is drinking wine sourced from their region. It's just an incredible display of, of wealth and riches. And it's interesting that we also have other verification of these claims of, of riches. We know that the Persian Empire did not last very long because a, another empire swept through them uh, like a knife through hot butter. That is the Greeks under Alexander. And we still have today records that the Greeks kept of all the wealth that they had plundered, all the booty that, that, that they had taken from the captured Persians. So the Greek historians document that when Alexander conquered Shushan, he found 40,000 talents of silver. A talent is about 70 pounds. Just multiply 70 pounds times 40,000, an incredible amount of silver. In another city, Persepolis, where they had another palace, another Persian palace, the Greeks describe that they needed 20,000 mules to carry away all the treasure that they had plundered. Uh, here it talks about, in, in the first chapter of the book of Esther, it describes all this fine cotton, all the turquoise wool, all the cords of linen, all the uh, garments were very, uh, very beautiful, uh, and very vast. The Greek historians describe uh, that when they conquered uh, Persepolis, they found 150 tons of of purple wool. Purple was always a color associated with royalty because the only way to make it uh, was you had to kill an animal that was purple. You, they had no artificial dye to make things purple and therefore it was very rare and they had 150 tons of purple wool. Moreover, the Alexander's general, uh, he sent a list of captured spoils to Alexander and it included roughly 5,000 pounds of golden cups. So here we see in the book of Esther, it's describing everyone drinking from golden cups as if they're water, as if everyone has it. And we know that indeed there was an incredible amount of golden cups that were, that were captured. So they're having this great celebration, 180 days plus seven days for the people of Shushan. And the king, he is riled up on the last day of the party. He wants to end it off with the bane and he is totally stoned. And he decides that he wants to bring in Vashti to settle a dispute. The Talmud tells us in the book of Megillah, it was the seventh day. And because it was the seventh day, it was Shabbos. And on Shabbos, the Jewish people are praying and studying, and they're not partake partaking. Whereas the Gentiles, they're still partying. And what do they do when they get drunk? They start comparing women. So you have all the noble women from Persia, and all the noble women from Media, and they're having an argument. And the Persians say, well, Persian women are the most beautiful. And the people from media say, well, the Mede women, they're the most beautiful. And Ahasuerus is in the middle of it. And his wife is Vashti. Vashti is the daughter of Belshazzar. Ahasuerus was the one who 
created alliances with the previous Babylonian Empire. So his wife is not a Persian and not a Mede. And he's upset that everyone's claiming that their wife is the most beautiful when in reality it's his wife. And he's going to prove it. He sends a message to Vashti. I want you to appear in front of the assemblage wearing your crown. And wearing your crown to the exclusion of any other garments. And she refuses. She doesn't want to appear in the nude in front of all these people. Now the Talmud tells us that there was actually a miracle that happened. She was indeed very beautiful. In fact, the Talmud makes a list of the four most beautiful women ever, and among that list is Vashti. And she would have been very happy uh, to display herself in front of everyone. The problem was, is that the Almighty made all kinds of blemishes and leprosy sprout up all over her. So she had a terrible acne. And she was so embarrassed of how she looked, she tells Ahasuerus, sorry, I'm not showing up. And Ahasuerus just summoned in front of everyone. All his friends are there. Everyone's there. Everyone who matters is there. And he is rebuffed by Vashti. What to do about such intransigence? So he calls over the great rabbis. And he tells them, what should we do? What do we do with Vashti? And the Talmud describes that the rabbis were in a pickle. If they say kill her, tomorrow he might regret his decision and pin the blame on them. If they say let her off the hook, well, he might be mad at them right now. So you don't have a solution. They told him, listen, since the day that the temple was destroyed, we we lost our ability to judge properly. We can't judge it. Why don't you have your people judge it? Go to the people. Go to your advisory board. So he goes over to his advisory board. They decide very clearly, well, she besmirched her husband. We have to replace her because you know why? All the women are going to be empowered. She said no to her husband. All the women will follow. Everyone's going to suffer. And Ahasuerus, you're going to be the one who brings this new attitude to the empire can happen. We have to kill her and replace her with someone better, which indeed is what happened. And they made an official rule that is irrevocable. You can never change this rule. Vashti will never appear before the king. We're going to find a replacement. It's interesting that at the end of the chapter, it mentions that they sent messages to all the reaches of the kingdom. Each country according to its language and according to its script. And this is indicative of the attitude that the Persians had. The Persians, unlike the Babylonians before them or the Greeks that came afterwards, after them, they were very tolerant of allowing people to maintain their culture. So they didn't force the conquered people to adapt and adopt their own, the Persian language or the Persian religion or the Persian script. They allowed them to maintain that. Whereas, as we know, the Greeks, the, the central tension that happened between the Jews and the Greeks was the fact that the Greeks wanted to infuse the Jewish nation, their conquered people, with Greek ideology and Greek culture, which is anathema to Judaism. But the Persians, they were quite tolerant, and they allowed the people that they conquered to live as they have done previously. And according to Jewish sources, this really is where the the problem happens in this story. The Persians were, they were welcoming to the Jews and they allowed them to partake in this big party. Jews are invited. Well, there's two kinds of enemies that we can have. We have the enemy that says we're not invited and we have the enemy that says that we are invited. And each one is a different kind of threat. When we're made a pariah and we're, and we're disincluded, that's one kind of, of, of problem. However, when we're invited and we're welcomed in, there's a second kind of problem that we're going to lose our identity and we're going to forget that we're special and we're different. And we thrive when we stand for what, what it means to be Jewish. We are invited here to Ahasuerus' party. Many Jews partook in that. Mordechai warned them not to. They partook in that and then they became vulnerable because they capitulated to absorbing Persian attitudes and partaking in, in Ahasuerus' party, they became vulnerable for the attacks and the threats that are to follow. 
So Vashti is gone. They begin this incredible contest between all the eligible matrons of the kingdom. They send messengers to, to every part, every region, find the beautiful women, and send them to Shushan. In this palace, there was actually an entire section cordoned off for women. Which women? Women part of the king's harem. How do you join the king's harem? Spend the night with him. That's it. Once you spend the night with the king, you can never be with any other man. And thus, for some women to be selected to partake in this contest to be the queen, well, that's great. I could be the queen. On the other hand, it does imperil any future relationship. You're going to be put in this prison, essentially, and you're never allowed to leave unless the king calls you by name. So women were incentivized and disincentivized to partake in this contest, but they were given a choice. And one of the women swooped up is a young girl by the name of Hadassah. Her Persian name is Esther. She is the niece of Mordechai. Mordechai is one of the leaders of the Jewish people. And he was one of the people who had come 70 years prior with Yechonia. He was a part of the Sanhedrin, part of the Torah leadership class of the Jewish people. And he was swept away to exile to Babylon. And now under now he's under Persian rule. And there's a knock at the door. Esther has a summons. She has to partake in this contest. And Mordechai gives her one rule. Don't reveal your identity. Don't tell them you're Jewish. Alternatively, he tells him, he tells her, don't tell the people of the palace that you are a descendant of King Saul, the first king of the Jewish people, was the King Shaul, Saul. Esther is a direct descendant of King Saul. She has royalty in her blood. And that makes her a much better candidate for queen. What Mordechai is telling her, you don't want to be queen. Because if you're queen, what's going to be with your Judaism? Therefore, don't tell them that you are actually quite eligible because you are a descendant of royalty. As fate would have it, Esther is brought there. She meets Ahasuerosh. Ahasuerosh is enamored with her. And right away, he places the crown upon her head. This young Jewish girl is suddenly at the seat of power in the whole world. She is now married to the king. And the Talmud tells us that chapter 2 really represents a theme that we see throughout Jewish history. Bad things always happen to us, but we're always saved. We're always an inch away from annihilation, and somehow we survive. And the Talmud tells us over here in this chapter that the Almighty always prepares the remedy before the illness. The Jewish people were not threatened quite yet. But even before Haman's ascendancy and his genocidal plans for the Jewish people, Esther is already well-placed to save the Jews. That's the first thing that happens in chapter 2. The second thing that happens in chapter 2 is that Mordechai foils an assassination attempt on the king. There were two of the king's counselors and advisors, Bitsan and Seresh, and they hatched a plan to assassinate the king. It's interesting that we actually found archaeological remains which list the king's advisors, and amongst those names are Bitsan and Seresh, the same people that appear in our book. They plan to kill the king. Mordechai overhears their plan. He reveals the plot to Ahasuerosh. It's investigated. It turns out that they are indeed planning a palace coup and they are hung. And in the book of the official records, it is inscribed that Mordechai saved the king. And this too will be very important later on in the story because this is another element that's going to bring about the eventual salvation of the Jewish people. Now, why did Mordechai, was Mordechai an investigative reporter? Was he a private eye? How did he know to foil the plot? The Talmud tells us an interesting story. Mordechai was a member of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. One of the requirements to be part of the Sanhedrin is to be fluent in all 70 languages spoken at the time. And the reason for that is because if you are listening to an argument 
between two sides and you are part of the Supreme Court, you cannot hear through a translator. You can't have someone speaking in Flemish or Vietnamese or whatever and then translating it to you in English. You have to understand the two sides in the language that they speak naturally. And therefore, part of the requirements was to speak all the languages. These two people, they see the old Jew and they start talking in Swahili or whatever language. He doesn't understand anything they're doing, but secretly he understands every word. And therefore, he was able to uncover their plot and save Ahasuerosh. Chapter 3 is where things really head south. Ahasuerus decides to appoint Haman. Haman from Agagi, the Agagite. He is a direct descendant of Agag, the king of Amalek. Amalek, the nemesis, the foe of the Jewish people. The nation that stands for everything that we oppose and opposes for everything we stand. He, the Hitler of his time, is given the reins of power. And Amalek actually appears at the very beginning of our run as a nation. Right after the splitting of the sea, the Jewish people are invincible. They have just humbled Pharaoh with ten plagues. The Egyptians were totally vanquished by the Jewish nation. They have God on their side. And before they even get to Sinai, it's a month, it's not even a month later, Amalek attacks them. Amalek, they are reckless. All they care about is destroying us. They cannot be reasoned with. And they don't care if they suffer along the way. And it describes, imagine you have this really hot bathtub. It's piping hot. No one's willing to jump in. No one wants to scald themselves by jumping into the furnace. Amalek says, I'm in. I don't care. Even a great personal loss and personal peril, if it means to attack the Jews, where do I sign? And we see this in the modern incarnation, or at least the 20th century's incarnation of Haman and the Amaleks. We know that the Nazis, they diverted resources away from their own war efforts, away from the efforts that would save Germany, or at least save the war effort, just kill the Jews. And many of the historians, uh, most notably Paul Johnson wrote a history of the Jews. It becomes clear that the only rationale that the, that the Nazis, that the Hitlerites had to invade Russia, it wasn't for the Liebenstrom, it wasn't for the living space. What it really was is because there was five million Jews in the Soviet Russia that Hitler wanted. By doing that, he opened up himself to a two-front war and eventually he lost everything. But that is the Amalek ideology. The Amalek ideology is I'm going to kill the Jews even if it means that I myself will die. The Amaleks are kamikazes with respect to the Jews. Now, Saul, he had made a very costly blunder that costed him his monarchy and actually led to this whole story. The prophet Samuel came to Saul and said to him, you have to destroy Amalek. You have to kill them. You have to kill their king, you kill their animals, destroy every remnant, because if you don't, the Jewish people will forever suffer. And he didn't listen. He allowed Agag, the king of Amalek, to survive, and he also allowed the animals of Amalek to not be killed. As a result, comes along Samuel and tells him, I'm sorry, God removed himself from you. You're, you're no longer king in God's eyes. And he found a replacement, and of course, that is King David. But it is interesting that Saul, he left Amalek alive and his great-great-great-great-granddaughter, Esther, she is going to be the centerpiece of the efforts to squelch the incarnation of Amalek in Persia to destroy Haman and to end that threat to Jewish life. But Amalek still continues. The first thing that Haman does after he's appointed is he makes everyone bow before him. And the verse points out something interesting. In chapter 3, verse 2, all the king's servants at the king's gate would bow down and prostrate themselves before Haman. So it mentions that it was the king's servants that would bow down to Haman. The Greek historian Herodotus, he writes that if you see two Persians meeting each other, you could right away find 
who is uh, primary. If they're on the same rank, then they kiss each other on the mouth. If one is on a higher rank and the other one is slightly lower, then they kiss on the cheek. And if one is on a higher rank and the other one is much, much lower, then the lower one prostrates himself, bows down before the higher ranking official. So it actually it explains what's going on over here. It says specifically all the king's servants at the king's gate would bow down and prostrate themselves before Haman. It was only the king's servants because they were on a much lower level than Haman. Haman's the prime minister. Haman's the viceroy. Haman's the second in command. You have to bow down. There is one person there who doesn't. And that, of course, is Mordechai. And the Jewish sources point out that Mordechai, we're told, he is a direct descendant of Benjamin. And in the book of Genesis, Jacob, he reunites with his brother Esau, and he is coming together with his four wives and his 11 sons. And when they meet Esau, they all bow down before him. However, there is a 12th son that has yet to be born, Benjamin. Benjamin was not present when Jacob and his sons bowed before Esau, and therefore his descendant, Mordechai, he has the spiritual fortitude and wherewithal to not bow down to Haman. Because he never capitulated, or his antecedents never capitulated initially to bowing down before the wicked one, that gave that gave Mordechai the strength to not bow down to Haman. And Haman sees this, and he is greatly disturbed. He's disturbed. Why does Mordechai not bow down to him? And there was a simple solution to his problem. The simple solution was just kill Mordechai. You're second in command. You can do whatever you want. But it was beneath him. And this is going to be his undoing. Haman's undoing is going to be the fact that he desires honor. And to him, to deal with a petty Jew, just one guy, that's beneath him. If I'm going to attack Mordechai, I'm going to attack his whole nation. And therefore, he decided to hatch a plan. He takes his dice. Dice in Persian is poor. And he spins the dice. And he's trying to find out when is the optimal time to destroy and annihilate the Jewish people. And he lands on the 13th day of the 12th month, the 13th day of Adar. Incidentally, Adar and all the names of the Jewish months are actually the Persian names of the months. And he decides that that's what he's going to do. On this day, we're going to kill all the Jews in one fell swoop. He goes over to the king and says, I have an idea. Listen, there's this one nation. It's kind of small. They're not so impressive. They're not so powerful. They're scattered throughout the land. You don't really need them. Let me kill them all. Oh, are you worried you're going to lose some taxes? I'll more than make up for it. I'm going to give you 10,000 Talents of silver, roughly equivalent to 300 tons of silver, and that will more than make up for it. And Akashverosh finds out these are the Jews, and he says, you know what? Kill the Jews and keep your money. I don't need your money. I'm in on this as well. And the Talmud tells us that really, who were the ones who were standing in the way of the Jews? There were two co-conspirators. Of course, there was Haman who initiated the plot, but Ahasuerus was as much of a contributor towards it as Haman was. And the Talmud illustrates, you have two neighbors. One of them has a ditch that he wants to fill, and one of them has a mound that he wants to get rid of. And each one of them can help each other. Each one of them has a problem that can only be solved by the other one. So Haman says, I want to I want to fill up my ditch. I'll pay you for your for your dirt to fill it up. Achashverosh, he has a mound. He wants to get rid of it. No, no, no. I don't need money for it. Just help me get rid of my problem. And therefore, we could both solve each of our own problems. And they send letters again to every nation sealed with the signet of Achashverosh that this day is going to be a day designated for destruction of the Jewish people. They will not be protected by anyone. Do with them what you wish. All the anti-Semites all over the empire gleefully greet these new, the news. We have a couple of months and then this menace will finally be gone. On the 13th day of Adar, we're going to kill them all. He gives over his signet ring to Haman. You stamp it. It's, fu- it's official. It's the law of the land. This is what's going to happen. The Talmud teaches us a very powerful lesson. It says that removing 
the ring is more powerful than 48 prophets and seven prophetesses. In our nation, we've had 48 named prophets and seven female prophets, prophetesses. And all of them are trying to bring the Jewish people to a better place. That's the role of the prophet. But you know who did more than anyone else? All the prophets, more than all of them combined. Who who did more to bring the Jewish people back and bring them to repentance, bring them back to God? It was Haman and Achashverosh. In this move, pulling off the ring and saying, we're going to kill all the Jews, that brought the Jewish people home. And this is an interesting theme that we see throughout throughout history. When they're nice to us, when they welcome us to their parties, we forget about God. And all the great prophets that come and scream at us, and Mordecai, it doesn't matter. It, does, it doesn't work. Or it works moderately. But you know what really brings us back to home? Brings us back to God? Brings us back to our destiny, our legacy, as the light unto the nation, as the nation that's going to bring the world to its completion, as the nation that stands under the flag of Torah? When they say, we're going to kill you all. When Haman is brandishing Ahasuerus' ring and holding up the edict to destroy the Jewish nation. Chapter 4 describes the sadness and the mourning and the lamentation that resulted from this. The Jewish people are terrified. They're scared. They're sad. They're worried. They're exasperated. What to do about this? Mordechai gets dressed up in sackcloths and he's crying and he's weeping, and he's lamenting, and they're praying, and they're fasting. How do we get rid of this decree? Esther finds out that Mordechai is mourning, so she sends him nice garments. Yeah, wear this instead. And he sends a message back. No, no, no. How could we, how could we not mourn when the Jewish people are on the chopping block? We're going to be destroyed. And he tells her, go to your husband, go to the king, and implore him and beg him and ask him to save the Jewish people. And she responds and she tells him through a messenger, through Hasach, who's the messenger, I can't just walk into the king's palace unannounced and uninvited. The rules are very clear. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court who is not summoned, his law is one, unequivocal, to be put to death, except for the one to whom the king shall extend the golden scepter. They may live. Now, I have not been summoned to come before the king for 30 days. You're asking me to go on a suicide mission, to go to the king without being invited. How can I do that? And Mordecai responds with one of the, I think maybe one of the most powerful ideals in the book, and I think, again, broadly applicable throughout Jewish history. Then Mordecai said to reply to Esther, Do not imagine in your soul that you will be able to escape in the king's palace any more than the rest of the Jews. You think, Esther, that you're safe in the palace and we're all going to die out here and you'll be fine? It's not going to happen. For if you persist in keeping silent at a time like this, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place while you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether it was just for a time like this that you attained the royal position. Mordechai is telling Esther and telling us, the Jewish people will have continuity. Every time we're threatened with existential damage, we will be saved. God promised it to us many times, and history has borne that out. The only question is, who is going to be the one to do it? Esther, he tells her, You were placed in the palace. You were selected out of the myriads of girls because of this opportunity that you're going to be granted. You're going to be afforded an opportunity to save the Jewish nation. Don't lose it because if you do, we're still going to survive. The Jewish nation will live on, but you will have blown your opportunity and you and your family's house will be destroyed forever. Esther agrees to go provided that the Jewish nation fasts and prays for three days that the mission should be successful. Chapter 5 tells about this encounter. On the third day, Esther donned royalty 
and stood in the inner courtyard of the king's palace, facing the king's palace, while the king was sitting in his royal throne. The king noticed Esther standing in the courtyard, and she found favor in his eyes. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And Esther touched the golden scepter. Okay, the first hurdle has been cleared. Esther is not going to be killed on the spot. It's interesting, in Persepolis, that other palace in Persia, they actually have a sculpted relief in the stone of King Xerxes, which according to many opinions is actually the same Achashverosh, and thus the, the, the Persian name, the, the name, the Greek name that we assigned him, Xerxes, is actually Achashverosh in Persian. Uh, there's a sculpture of him holding a very long, thin scepter. Probably the same scepter that's being described in our story. Okay, Esther, what do you want? Asks Achashverosh. I'll give you up to half the kingdom. And the Talmud tells us that what really he's subliminally telling her is, I'll give you almost anything, but not everything. There's one thing that's halfway through the kingdom I'm not going to give you. And what's that? That's the temple. And the Talmud tells us the temple's right in the center of the world. Thus, if Ahasuerus controls the whole world, what is right in the middle of his kingdom? Jerusalem and the temple. I'll give you up to half the kingdom. Everything, but not Jerusalem, not the temple. And she says, no, 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 I don't want that at all. All I want is a party. We know you like parties. Let's make another party. I want to invite you and Haman to a feast that I'm going to prepare for him. Sounds good. They sign up to come to the party. Everyone's ready. Everyone's there. Ahasuerus is there. Haman's there. Esther's there. What do you want? Quite simple. All I want is another party. We'll do that one tomorrow. Sounds great. Okay, what does she really want? I guess we'll find out tomorrow. And this is really the high point of Haman's life. Out of the entire world, the two most powerful people, Ahasuerus and Esther, they have a party. Who do they invite? They invite him. And he is beaming. He is on cloud nine. And he is so excited. And not only that, they invited me tomorrow to another party. Unbelievable. And then he walks out. Everyone's bowing down before him. But he sees all the way in the distance, he sees Mordechai not bowing down. And he gets consumed with rage. He's boiling. He knows that there's a few months till they destroy all the Jews. But nothing. He doesn't have anything going for him. Nothing is worth it for him. He has no he has no joy, no pleasure in his life because of Mordechai. And he goes home and he complains to his wife. Well, what am I going to do? All the honor and all the riches and all, everything, it's not worth it for me. Because I see Mordechai not bowing down before me. She tells him, what are you talking about? You have a problem. Hang, hang the guy and forget about your problem. He finally agrees. We're going to kill Mordechai's people in several months. We're going to kill Mordechai really soon. He builds in his backyard gallows that are going to be 50 cubits high, towering above the whole city. We're going to hang Mordechai there soon. And he just needs to get the king's approval, and he goes back that night to visit the king. Now, simultaneously, the king is tossing and turning in bed. He's having bad dreams. He can't fall asleep. Now, why can't he fall asleep? So we know from Greek historians that to dine with the king, with the Persian king, was very unusual. Either they dined alone or with close family. It was almost unheard of... <coughs> It was almost unheard of when someone, a foreigner, even a high-ranking official, would dine together with the king. And the Talmud writes that he suspected a conspiracy. Esther's there and Haman's there. Haman, of course, is power-hungry. This is what they want to do. They're plotting together to kill me. And they're lulling me into, uh, into a state where I'm vulnerable. But then Ahasuerus says, wait a minute. I have lots of friends. And if there's this intrigue and there's conspiracy to kill me, someone should have told me about it. It must be, concludes Ahasuerus, that the people don't believe that I'm good. They don't believe that if they reveal the plot to me, I'll reward them. There must be an instance where someone tried to save my life and successfully did that, and I didn't reward them 
sufficiently, adequately, and therefore no one's, no one finds it important to tell me because no one has any incentive to reveal the conspiracy to me. So in the middle of the night, he gets up and he calls over the arch- archivist or the archivist. And he tells him, I want you to find the story where someone saved my life and I didn't pay them. And he's flipping through. And what does he find? Mordechai. Mordechai saved Ahasuerosh from the plot, the assassination plot of Bitsan and Seresh. And how was he rewarded, asks Ahasuerosh? He wasn't. He wasn't? We got to do something about that. And as he's figuring out what to do, there's a knock on the door. Who's there? Haman's there. Haman wants to come kill Mordechai. Haman says, okay, I have a very important question. Wait, before you start, I need your advice. What should I do for someone that I want to honor? So Haman is like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I've been asking for. The king wants to finally honor me for all the good work I've done. Who could he possibly be wanting to honor more than me? So he comes up with the most outlandish, over-the-top honor that he's going to get. So he says, okay, first thing we got to do, we got to take your crown. And we got to take your horse. And we have to put the crown on the person. And we have to give him your horse. And we have to take the highest-ranking official to parade him throughout the streets, to, to announce in front of everyone, so shall be done to the person the king, that the king wishes to honor. Hashir says, you are incredible at this. I'm, I'm going to accept your plan. Sounds amazing. I want you to go to Mordechai. The same person that Haman has been planning to go in this conversation to ask Ahasuerus to kill, go to Mordechai and do for him exactly what you just described without changing a smidgen of the plans. Nothing. Exactly the way you did it. And because you're the highest official, you're going to be the one to lead the celebration. Mordechai, of course, is still praying and fasting. And he sees Haman there. Haman, of course, is coming to kill him, right? Wrong. Haman came to give him a ride. Mordechai tells him, according to the Talmud, that, listen, I've been fasting for a long time. I'm very weak. I can't get onto the horse. I need you to be a human footstool so I can climb on you. And he climbs on him, and the Talmud strikes him an extra kick to add injury to insult. And he has to parade him throughout the whole town, announcing, so shall be done to the person that the king wants to honor. Along this route that he takes throughout the whole city, he passes his own block, his own street. And his daughter, she sees this amazing procession coming by, and this resplendent character with the crown on his head is on the horse and the poor guy in front of him is leading him. So she concludes it must be that this is the final insult being levied to Mordechai. He has to lead Haman throughout the streets. So she starts. She's all excited. She's fired up and she decides she's going to pour some trash over Mordechai. So she finds all the trash and she dumps it right there when the right below them all on the head of the guy leading the procession. Ah, I got Mordechai. And then Haman looks up and she sees, oh, I just dumped all the trash on daddy. And she gets consumed with guilt and she jumps off and she dies. So Haman now stinks. He's all sweaty from this procession. He's covered with the trash that his daughter threw upon him. And he's mourning for the death of his daughter. So he's smarting from humiliation, reeking and disheveled. And the people come. We have a party today. Remember the party that you signed up for yesterday? Second banquet? Got to get there right now. Everyone's waiting for the king and the queen are waiting for you. Doesn't get a chance to shower. And this is going to be his final walk of shame. So the king and Haman are there with, at the feast. And the king asks Esther again. What do you want? Anything up to half the kingdom. I'll give it to you. And Esther responds quite simply. If I have found favor in your eye, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted to me in my request and my people in my petition. All I want is to survive and not to be killed. If we're just sold as slaves, 
I can bear that. But if they're going to destroy us and kill us all, I have to open up my mouth. The king is totally flummoxed. What is she? Who wants to kill the queen? Who is this? Where is this one who dared to do so? Who is the person that's trying to kill? And she points here, right here with us. The wicked Haman. He is the adversary and he is the enemy. And the king is so consumed with with wrath. Haman wants to kill Esther, his beloved Esther. He needs to go out and clear his mind. He goes inside and clears his mind and Haman, he starts, he has no choice. He knows that uh, this does not uh, bode well for him. So he starts prostrating himself before Esther. The king walks back in and he sees Haman collapsing on top of Esther. He's like, oh, you're going to steal Esther from me as well? And a third thing, Harvona, one of the king's advisors, pulls the king outside. See, see that huge gallow? That is the gallows that Haman had erected to hang Mordechai. Mordechai, who saved the king's life, Haman wants to kill him. So in a fit of impulsivity, like he had shown prior when he killed Vashti, Ahasuerus says, okay, we're going to hang Haman on those gallows, and Haman is marched away. Chapter 8 tells that now the tables have turned. The famous words that we say, Venahapahu, has been turned on its head. Everything bad that had planned to happen was good. Haman had built these gallows for Mordechai, and he himself was hung there. Mordechai assumes the role previously held by Haman, and Esther goes and says, okay, we have a decree outstanding on the 13th day of the month of Adar that all the Jews are subject to being killed. Let's amend that. We're going to switch it, that the Jews can now kill their enemies. For months now, the enemies of the Jews have been sharpening their swords and getting ready for the day where they can finally destroy the Jews. They have been removed from obscurity. Everyone knows who the anti-Semites are and those same people who had been planning to kill the Jewish people on that day are themselves going to die on that day. Chapter 8, verse 16, describes the joy and the jubilation and the glee that consumed the city. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. La Yehudim ta or Rav Simcha, v'sason v'ikar, says the Talmud. What does this mean, that they had light and joy and gladness and honor? Light is a reference for Torah. Joy is a reference for a festival, for a holiday. Gladness is a reference for the circumcision. And honor is a reference for the tefillin. What it's telling us is, is that Haman was someone that had tried to reorient the Jewish nation away from their true purpose and true identity, true legacy to something else. He had made himself the king, himself the God, bow down before him. In fact, the Talmud tells us, where does Haman appear in the Torah? Now, of course, Haman happens a thousand years after the Torah is finished, after Moshe and the Torah has been sealed. But where is there a hint towards Haman, and it finds a hint to Haman in the story of the sin of the Garden of Eden. Hamin ha'etz asher tzivisicha. God says to Adam, did you eat from the tree that told you not to eat from? And the word for did you eat from that tree is hamin, which is the same letters as haman, Haman. What it's telling us is that Haman was living with the ideal of the sin of of the Garden of Eden. That in that sin, man, what was the plan of man? Man was planning to be like a God who knows good and bad. Haman was someone who embodied that more than anyone else. He was someone who says, I'm the God bow down before me. And this was turned on its head. The Jewish people had joy and delight and light and gladness and honor. What kind of honor? What kind of joy? What kind of light? A light of Torah a light of recognizing that we have a special connection with God, with the bris milah, and what we stand for, what we herald, is the Torah and everything that it means. On Purim, we, we remembered that man is not a god. Man, instead, is a servant of the Almighty. And the Talmud tells us elsewhere that this spiritual reawakening led the nation to actually, to actually reaccept the Torah. The Jewish people accepted the Torah twice. 
once at the foot of the mountain of Mount Sinai, and they renewed their vows on the holiday of Purim. The Jews killed their enemies. In the city of Shushan, they killed 500 anti-Semites. On the following day, Ahasuerus agreed to have another day, and they killed 800 more, including the 10 sons of Haman. Finally, there was peace and quiet in the Jewish nation. All their enemies were dead, and thus the day following the salvation was made into a holiday, a day that they obtained relief from their enemies, the day of the holiday of Purim, to celebrate it with a lavish feast, with gifts to each other, with gifts to the poor, and of course, with reading the Megillah. And these mitzvos, these commandments that are the order of the day, they are actions that demonstrate who we really are as a nation. We read the Megillah and we find the fact that God is there for us and we're in this saving us. We connect to love of God. We connect to love of each other. We, we give gifts to the poor. We give gifts to each other. And we also have a feast. We love ourselves, ourselves too. That's also okay. Now, after this, these events, Ahasuerus died. How he died is a matter of debate. It's possible that he was assassinated. But regardless, according to Jewish sources, his successor was Darius, which according to Jewish sources is the son of Ahasuerus and Esther. So he was technically Jewish and he is going to pave the way for the second temple to be built. The second temple had begun 18 years prior in the year 370 or 369 when Cyrus had signed off on the initial plan to rebuild it, but it was halted. The plans resumed in earnest under Darius, Darius II, who may have been Jewish indeed as uh, due to his progeny, as uh, due to his pedigree as the son of Esther. And that kickstarted the next great epic of Jewish history, the Second Temple Era. We know that the body that oversaw the spiritual development of the nation at this time as men of the Great Assembly, they were there to oversee all these new changes that were going to be afoot uh, during this time with the Jewish people, half of them are still living in Babylon or in Persia. Some of them are living in Israel. The Second Temple is being rebuilt. Part of the things that they did, part of their requirements that they, part of their edicts that they enacted was the sealing of the Jewish canon. One of the 24 books, the holy books of the Jewish nation, they're included in the Tanakh, them to the exclusion of any other. And the last entry, the last book to be included in the 24 books of the Tanakh is the book that was published very, very recently, the book of Esther. The Talmud actually says that Esther herself, the co-author of the book together with Mordechai, lobby the great rabbis of Israel to include this book. They're having a debate. What's included? What's not included? And Esther sends a message from Persia. Please include my book. That it should be an eternal book of the Jewish people. And the rabbis write back to them. Read the story. The story is one of triumph. We're triumphing over our enemies. What are you doing? You're trying to arouse envy of all the of all our enemies. That's not a good idea. So she tells him, you know what? This whole story is already recorded in the official chronicles and archives of the kings of Persia and Media. The story is out there anyhow. Let us celebrate it. Let us remember it. Let us remember the miracles that God did for us in the story of Purim. And that is indeed what happens and what we celebrate and revisit every year on Purim.